The universe may mostly be empty space, but if we all have the time to observe it, we are bound to see objects crashing into each other, causing a massive impact to where it is. Join us in this episode as we take a journey to know more about what happens when worlds literally collide. As the solar system evolved from a simple cloud of dust swirling around a protostar to what we know it today, it is unavoidable that a lot of space objects will eventually collide with one another. It's just basic thermodynamics. The amount of disorder will increase over time. We call these collisions cosmic impact or impact events. These happen when astronomical objects such as asteroids, planets, meteorites, and comets, generally speaking, crash into one another resulting in scalable impact around it. This effect can vary from a simple creation of a crater on a planetary surface, like we see on the moon, or to something as grand as the creation of a new moon, like what happened to the Earth when the asteroid Thea collided with it. These events are fairly regular to our solar system, but one of the biggest of them all, the one that brought a massive change, was the event that we potentially call the Late Heavy Bombardment, a hypothesized event in the solar system's history where a large number of planetesimals, like comets, meteors, and asteroids, collided with other planets, particularly the terrestrial ones, producing massive effects. This is a very violent period in the timeline of our solar system, especially to the inner planets, since they, or we, are the ones that are gravely experienced by this cataclysmic event. For the sake of the video, and since saying the late heavy bombardment is such a tedious task, we will refer to this event as LHB from this point moving forward. We're the generation of abbreviations anyway, aren't we? What caused the LHB? To fully understand what resulted to the LHB, we need to go back to when our solar system was still at its infant stages, before there were planets and moons moving about. Like all stellar systems, our very own Sun once began as a young star, surrounded by a cloud of dust and gas which had collectively spun around to form a protoplanetary disk. Some particles garnered in the disk clumped together, and due to their own weak gravity, they formed pebble-sized planetesimals, which then attracted more and more of its kind, and a few other particles, eventually forming what we know today as planets, asteroids, dwarf planets, and comets. The planets attempted to stabilize their own orbits, and the very first ones to be successful at this feat are the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. But what about the Jovian planets? Well, they're an entirely different story. Now we are getting closer to the LHB. Enter our two giants, Jupiter and Saturn. At the early stages, their orbits were extremely unstable, as it is still trying to find a sweet spot, or in a manner it can move at a constant speed without disturbance. Because of how their orbits influenced one another, it produced an effect that scientists call a 2 to 1 resonance, meaning every one part of Jupiter's orbit equates to two parts of Saturn's. This caused an irregularity in the gravitational force to the objects that are close to them. Now enter to the picture our last two planets, Uranus and Neptune. Neptune wasn't always the youngest in the solar system, being placed in last. Once upon a time, it was closer to the Sun, and Uranus was actually the last planet in the line. But because of the resonance from the two large planets, it was destabilized out of its orbit until it was pushed away to the farthest region of the solar system. At this place, the planetesimals were still moving about. Since Neptune was sent out into their area, it caused a disturbance in their constant motion and a lot of the planetesimals were kicked away to different directions. Space debris was flying everywhere. Some moved away from the solar system, while others moved towards the inner planets and became the components of the late heavy bombardment. This is the most popular hypothesis on what possibly caused the LHB. There are several others that attempt to give an explanation, such as the late formation of the outermost planets, Uranus and Neptune, the presence of the fifth inner planet with an unstable orbit, and the disruption of an asteroid crossing, Mars. A lot more are hypothesized nowadays, but as many as they are, scientific knowledge is always a subject of scrutiny. And as scientists, we aim to be as sure as we can with the formation that's most consistent, right? 
the result of the LHB. It is crazy to think that sometime billions of years ago, the inner planets received a massive swarm of planetesimals from the outer region of the solar system. But how exactly do we know for sure that this happened? Why do we even consider this event as relevant? Well, let me provide you with the after effects of the LHB. The Caloris Basin in Mercury if we have an impact event, almost usually we are bound to find a lot of craters everywhere. One of the largest craters in the solar system can be found in Mercury. It is also known as the Caloris Basin, spanning about 1,550 kilometers in diameter. That's around 17,000 football fields across. According to scientists, the impact that created this crater must have been so forceful that it consequently formed a hilly terrain at the crater's antipode at the other side of the planet. Imagine how strong the force has to be to move the soil at the other side of the planet. How do we know that the LHB caused this to happen? Well, the event was hypothesized to have occurred around 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. The crater's age was determined to be around 3.8 to 3.9 billion years old. We can clearly see how the timeline of these events overlap and might have been one resulting from the other. This is just one scar that the LHB has left. Imagine what else it could have done to the rest of the inner planets. Disqualified candidate, Venus's odd rotation. If you haven't heard yet, Venus is kind of a weirdo in a lot of ways. It moves slowly, it is extremely hot for its position, and most especially, unlike other planets that rotate counterclockwise on its axis, Venus rotates in the opposite direction. This phenomenon puzzled scientists up to this very day, and several theories are being studied about why this is the case. Astronomers thought that once upon a time, the planet might have been moving in the same manner as everyone else. It just makes sense that the direction of rotation of the star ought to be similar to the direction of motion of the dust cloud around it, and is therefore similar to the rotation of the planets and other objects formed around it, right? One theory that scientists thought was that at some point, an object might have collided with it with a force so strong that Venus got completely reoriented to the opposite direction. Sadly, this theory didn't hold much, though. Scientists later realized that this hypothesis couldn't have happened. Why? Well, if there were truly an object that caused the planet to flip vertically, wouldn't it have had an energy so strong that it would have destroyed the planet first? Obviously, this is not the case, since we can still see Venus but it would have made a great testament to the magnitude of how massive the LHB truly was. Although you got to admit how crazy it would be if the hypothesis were true, right? Mars and the Hellas Basin Okay, now let's go back to something more realistic and observable. If there would be a heavy bombardment coming from the outer regions of the solar system, the first line of defense of the inner planets would have been Mars, and it certainly served that purpose to some extent. If we were to observe the Martian surface, we would see two evidences of collision impact on its surface. First is the North Pole Basin, located at the North Pole of the planet, and the second is the fourth largest impact crater in the solar system, Hellas Basin. Measured at 2,300 kilometers wide and around 7,200 meters deep, this huge impact crater was theorized to have formed around the time of the LHB. At the antipode of this crater, astronomers also found a volcano. Could this be a consequence of the impact of the asteroid that caused the crater in Hellas? This question is still a mystery to our hard-working scientists. Earth's Water – LHB's Gift Now I know you're wondering, was the planet Earth immune to the effects of the LHB? Well, if your answer is yes, then you're correct. Remember how the bombardment affected severely the inner planets? Well, we belong to that group, so we got to have something too. But before we move forward, we must clarify a few things. It is a theory that upon the formation of the Earth, there must have been already water in the planetesimals that clustered together to form our home sweet home planet. This is why it is hypothesized that if we were to make an expedition to dig deep towards the center of the Earth, we are bound to find deposits of water, as there were icy planetesimals involved in the planetary formation. No one is claiming that the LHB brought all the water to Earth, clear? Okay, now here's the catch. 
Scientists found out that all the water that may have been present during that period couldn't have accounted for all the water that we have in the planet today. If you go back to an early science class, you would remember that Earth is practically 70% water. One supplement to answer this was the presence of comets. These objects are practically icy rocks that are traveling the solar system constantly. Some might have collided on Earth at some point and filled it with water. It seems like a great answer, right? Well, not entirely. Firstly, the water from the comets might not be enough to fill the volume it has today. Secondly, the water from the comets are composed of a different hydrogen atom. It couldn't have come exclusively from that. The most probable cause was, you guessed it, ice from more comets and asteroids brought by the LHB. As the planet was barraged with all kinds of objects from the late heavy bombardment, the heat from the energy of the impacts may have melted the ice that were on this debris. This debris condensed, and as the Earth cooled down, the condensation became rain, finally filling up the Earth to the blue planet that we know and love today. While the other planets experienced a lot of destruction, Earth received a pleasant gift, which eventually led to life as we know it. Lunar Cataclysm, the AKA of the LHB. Another terminology used to refer to the late heavy bombardment was Lunar Cataclysm, as this event heavily changed the topology of the Moon. If we were to take a telescope, wait for nighttime, and point that telescope to the Moon, the first and most obvious thing we could see on its surface was the abundance of craters. With over 1,700 of them, a quick impression would be, wow, the Moon must have taken a lot of hits frequently at some point. And you would be right. In fact, it's probable that the Moon may have experienced a massive spray of space objects, mostly at a single time, during the late heavy bombardment. How do we know this for certain? One of the objectives of the Apollo missions were to bring back samples from the Moon that could be investigated here on Earth. From these rocks and through the help of radiometric dating, it was observed that these rocks were around 3.8 to 4.1 billion years old. And as compared to the age of the sample taken from the crust, which was around 4.5 billion years, the rocks were way younger, a great support for the lunar cataclysm hypothesis. Since the Earth is practically in the same place as the Moon, evidences of the heavy bombardment can also be traced on the Earth's surface. As we have discussed previously, one trace of this is the presence of the volume of water that we currently have. Another evidence were the age of some rocks that can be found on Earth that could be as old as 4.1 billion years, which as we have mentioned earlier coincides perfectly with the time of the LHB. Lunar Cataclysm Criticism Like all great knowledge, science is not science without intellectual scrutiny. Unimmune to criticism, Lunar Cataclysm also has its fair share of non-believers. What's particularly unconvincing to some were two things. First, a lot of the samples may have just been taken from a single crater basin. In fact, it must have been taken from the youngest of them all, Imbrium Basin. That being said, it could be that there was a strong bias on the sample collection, since most of them were just taken from one place. Second, there's a relatively small number of impact rocks that are older than 4.1 billion years. As scientists, we should understand the doubt this arises, since as scientists, it should be a common practice, to be honest, with the data that we present. If there were a really small margin of bias, wouldn't the age of the rocks have a medium to large variance? There is no way to be sure whether the supporters or the doubters are correct with regards to this issue. I mean, the only way we can be sure is to actually be there and make an observation, right? However, scrutiny isn't a bad thing. Doubt is a natural trait for scientists. A naturally curious mind must always be open to the possibility of other theories trampling an existing one. It's just that for the meantime, one theory is more consistent than any other, and until a new one comes with a better explanation of natural phenomenon, we should hold on to this new one. That's about it for today's video. What do you think is the most important cosmic event in the history of our solar system? Let us know by commenting it down below. If you want more videos like this, don't forget to like the video and hit that subscribe button. Also click the bell so that you'll get notified whenever we release a new video. See you next time. Stay insanely curious.